Well, he said, this is the truth. What is the truth? Christ is Lord. Jesus Christ is Lord. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Rod Hembry. I'm Corey. And I'm Ryan. And this program is called Quick Study Television Weekend Edition as we go through the Bible, learning about what God is telling us. Now, we are studying Matthew 12 today. That is interesting. What did you do, Corey? I'm actually going to look back a little bit to Matthew chapter 11 that mentions the imprisonment of John the Baptist. So we're going to be focusing in on that imprisonment today. Okay, very good. That is excellent. And Ryan, you're here. What did you study? Well, today I'm studying a colorful little critter that brings a whole new meaning to the phrase, you are what you eat. Okay, excellent. That is very good. You are what you eat. Excellent. And today we're going to focus on Jesus Christ. He is basically a man who eats on the Sabbath in a very unique way. And that way offends the Pharisees. We'll talk about that and more. Get your Bible guide. Let's study. Matthew chapter 11 mentions the imprisonment of John the Baptist by Herod. In this case, it's Herod Antipas who has uh, taken John the Baptist prisoner. You and I are going to be focusing in on the place of that imprisonment. It is a fortress city in the wilderness. It's not mentioned by any of the gospel narratives, but it is mentioned by another first century historian. Take a look. Machaerus was one of the mountain fortresses utilized and refinished by Herod the Great. Its location east of the Dead Sea in modern day Jordan was strategic as a warning system against invasions from the east and also strategic in its tremendous height. Built high up on a natural mountain, the fortress of Machaerus had a unique view of all the other major defensive cities of Israel. These cities, though they could not see one another, did have a clear line of sight to Machaerus. Strategically, this meant that Machaerus acted as a messenger fortress. Its signal fires could communicate to all cities at once, for itself or as a middleman. Though Herod the Great was the most famous Herod to utilize Machaerus, and credit must be given to him for rebuilding the ruined Machaerus fortress, he is not the Herod most famous for living or staying at Machaerus. That right goes to his son Herod Antipas and his famous birthday party. According to the Gospels and first century historian Josephus, John the Baptist resisted the unlawful marriage between Antipas and his sister-in-law Herodias. As a result, Result, Antipas imprisoned John. During his birthday party, Antipas had Herodias's daughter Salome dance for his guests, after which he gave her a request. She asked for the head of John the Baptist on a platter. Though the Bible doesn't tell us where John was imprisoned or executed, Josephus does, Machaerus. John would have been kept in the lower city while Antipas partied up in the royal palace within the security of the citadel. Interestingly, the site of ancient Machaerus seems to have been forgotten very soon after its destruction by Rome when Jewish rebels used it as a hideaway. Only relatively recently, in 1807, was the upper citadel rediscovered. Since then, extensive excavations have taken place, and Herod the Great's signature luxury style can be seen throughout the design. Mosaics, a royal garden, formal dining room, Roman bath, and royal courtyard have all been identified. 
This example of being able to explore the place of John the Baptist's imprisonment is a really good example of how first century Roman history can really fill in the blanks of the gospel narrative. See, when the gospels were being written, it was common knowledge that John the Baptist was taken prisoner by Herod Antipas and that that occurred at the fortress wilderness city of Machaerus. So the gospel narratives didn't need to mention it. They edit out a lot of unnecessary information or uh, information that we may not see as unnecessary, but it is unnecessary to the narrative of the story uh, and, and the overall composition of the book. Uh, but when we look into historians like Josephus and they begin uh, telling uh, of these histories, we are able to piece together some of those, uh, some of that information that we have unfortunately lost in the course of 2000 years of church history. Now, ideally that information would have been passed on uh, by all of uh, our, our great grandparents down to us, but some of it, of course, has not been passed on. And so this is where the study of history and archaeology of the first uh, century AD and even the second century AD can really help us fill in those gaps. So in this case, is anything earth shattering learned from knowing the fortress city of John the Baptist imprisonment? No, it's not. But it does help us uh, fill in some of the cultural context of that day and why the imprisonment of John the Baptist was important. One difference about Christianity, not political ideals, but spiritual realities, is that Jesus Christ was and continues to be God. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are one in the Godhead. Now this is more than a cultural belief or a political belief. It's more than a way of thinking. It is spiritual in every sense of the word. Matthew chapter 12, recounts Jesus Christ confronting that which proved his point. God shows Jesus Christ is Lord of the Sabbath and demonstrated Jesus Christ healing on the Sabbath day. The Lord our God also reveals Jesus Christ was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, chapter 40, verses one through four. No one can be a Christian in truth without believing that Jesus Christ is Lord. Matthew 12, verses 1 through 21. At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath, and his disciples were hungry and began to pluck heads of grain and to eat. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. But he said to them, Have you not read what David did when he was hungry, he and those who were with him? How he entered the house of God and ate the showbread, which was not lawful for him to eat, nor for those who were with him, but only for the priests? Or have you not read in the law that on the Sabbath the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless? Yet I say to you that in this place there is one greater than the temple, but if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is Lord, even of the Sabbath. Now when he had departed from there, he went into their synagogue, and behold, there was a man who had a withered hand. And they asked him, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath, that they might accuse him? Then he said to them, What man is there among you who has one sheep, and if it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will not lay hold of it and lift it out? Of how much more value, then, is a man than a sheep? Therefore it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Then he said to the man, Stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out, and it was restored as whole as the other. 
Then the Pharisees went out and plotted against him how they might destroy him. But when Jesus knew it, he withdrew from there. And great multitudes followed him, and he healed them all. Yet he warned them not to make him known, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, Behold, my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved, in whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him, and he will declare justice to the Gentiles. He will not quarrel nor cry out, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and smoking flax he will not quench, till he sends forth justice to victory, and in his name Gentiles will trust. Matthew chapter 12, verses 1 through 21. I know and I remember the times when often I have gone out and uh, I have been really excited about this. I'm going to go out and witness for the Lord, you know, and, and, uh, and I'm excited about it and I go out and do it. And sometimes uh, I don't do well and other times I do well according to what I feel. But the truth is that as we seek God and we do it for the Lord Jesus Christ, he will help us. How many people never do that? How many people never ask the Lord? Who can I tell about Jesus Christ? Because they're afraid or, you know, they might, somebody might step on them or whatever. But we need to listen today because this is very important. Get your Bible out and your Bible guide. This is 32 pages, new every month. Comes to you. We'll send it to you when you send a gift in any amount to one of the three addresses at the bottom of the screen or go to www.biblediscoverytv.com. Biblediscoverytv.com and click on the donate button and, uh, Make a donation and we'll send it to you when you write to us. Works of faith, that's the way that we talk about this and capsulize this whole movement. And in the works of faith segment, the only way to really title this is the truth. Christ is God. That's the truth. Jesus Christ is God's only son, God the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. That's what we want to proclaim today through the scripture over 2,000 years old telling us the truth about what God has done. We read Matthew chapter 12. This is a great one. I love it. And we're looking at Matthew chapter 12, verses 1 to 21. And as we consider this, we need to think about, Lord, what are you telling us today? Father, help us today to know what you're saying to us. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are open to hear you. And we said together, amen. Now, when we look at Matthew chapter 12, verses 1 through 8, Listen carefully and, and let's read this a little slower so we can get it. It says here, at that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. Really, on the Sabbath, Jesus is going to the grain fields? Yes. And his disciples, they were hungry. And they began to pluck heads of grain and to eat. Well, when the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. But he said to them, have you not read what David did when he was hungry? He and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God and ate the showbread, which was not lawful for him to eat, nor for those who were with him, but only for the priest. Or have you not read in the law that the Sabbath, on the Sabbath, the priest in the temple, they profane the Sabbath and they are blameless? Yet I say to you that in this place there is one greater than the temple. But if you had known what this means, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Wow, that's intense. Jesus Christ ate on the Sabbath day, but did not follow the rules of the Pharisees. Why? Well, that's interesting. They were upset because he did not obey their ideas of how to keep the Sabbath holy. Jesus Christ, he is the Holy One. Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Jesus Christ is the One. And the Sabbath day is very important. We must remember that the rules for the Sabbath day, they're not to be honest, like, you know, don't do this, don't do that, don't do this. Now, hold on a minute. It's not the rules. 
We must observe resting on the Sabbath. That's very important. And that, you know, to some people, that means, well, you don't do this, 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 this. Well, hold on a minute. We need to do something that takes our mind off of work, that takes our mind out of that arena so we can focus on and concentrate on God and relax. Very important. Matthew chapter 12, verses 9 to 14 say, Now when he had departed from there, he went into their synagogue, gathering place. And behold, there was a man who had a withered hand. And they asked him, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath, that they might accuse him? Well, then he said to them, What man is there among you who has one sheep, one sheep, and if it falls into the pit on the Sabbath, will not lay hold of it and lift it out? Of how much more value then is a man than a sheep? Therefore, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Then he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And he stretched out his hand, and it was restored as the whole as the other. And then the Pharisees, they went out and they plotted against Jesus, how they might destroy him. Isn't it interesting? Jesus Christ healed on the Sabbath to show that good comes from the Sabbath, the Pharisees were so bound up by their laws about the Sabbath, they did not understand Jesus Christ. They didn't even focus on the man who was healed. They didn't get it. You see, beloved, when we understand this, when we realize what Jesus is doing, we have to understand that he will do what's good on the Sabbath. Now, you know, mankind can't really do that. But Jesus can inside our hearts. And Jesus empowers us and helps us to do that. We need to remember that because we go through his strength, not ours. Very important. His strength, not ours. We go to chapter 12, verse 15 to 21. It says, but when Jesus knew it, he withdrew from there and great multitudes followed him and he healed them all, all of them. Yet he warned them, do not make him known that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, behold my servant, whom I have chosen, my beloved in whom my soul is well pleased, will put my spirit upon him and he will declare justice to the Gentiles. He will declare justice to the Gentiles. Interesting point. He will not quarrel or cry out, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he, may not, he will not break, and a smoking flax he will not quench till he sends forth justice to victory. And his name, and in his name, Gentiles, Gentiles will trust. Which brings me to this point. Jesus Christ is the Lord. As Isaiah the prophet said, there are many places in the New Testament where the Old Testament is quoted and reinforced. We need to realize that Jesus Christ came for the world. He didn't come for one race. He came for the world, beloved. Now, it's true that he has a special plan for those people who are chosen, but Jesus Christ came for you. Jesus Christ came for me. Jesus Christ came for us. And our response is clear. We need to pray and say, Jesus Christ, come into my heart. Jesus Christ, please help me to follow you. I believe you, you died on the cross and you rose again. And today I give my life to you. Pray that prayer. Come to Jesus Christ, make him Lord of your life.
Coming up next time on Quick Study Television, the purpose of the parables. What in the world is Jesus doing by telling stories? Well, we'll talk about that and much more next time on Quick Study Television. Right now, here's Ryan. In today's science report, we're exploring a type of slug called the nudibranch. Now, this abundant little creature amazingly ingests other creatures, including deadly predators, and actually uses what it's ingested as its own defense system. Take a look. You are what you eat. We've all heard this saying before, but the nudibranch takes this to the extremes. The nudibranch, a type of sea slug, will ingest sponges, anemones, barnacles, other sea slugs including their own species, and other deadly predators that most other sea creatures avoid, and then actually become what they eat. For example, some will ingest poisonous sponges, store that poison in their own bodies, and then use it for their own benefit. Others will eat jellyfish or anemones and pass their poison stingers right through their stomach and into the surface of their skin, storing them in their tentacles where they can be used for defense. Also interesting is that these tiny little alien looking life forms are one of the most common and most beautiful in the world. Nudibranchs are gastropods, which means stomach foot, and there are more than 60,000 named species of gastropods living everywhere, land and sea. The nudibranch lives in oceans and saltwater seas all over the world, and there are more than 3,000 known species. They also come in many different shapes and colors. They can be round or flat or short or long. And while some fall into the background using camouflage, others sport vast and vivid colors like bright green polka dots or colorful blue stripes. Although nudibranchs, meaning naked gill, do not have fish-like gills, they do have tentacle-like bulges on their back that they breathe through. They also have very small eyes embedded on their back, which can perceive light and darkness. However, they get around mainly by smell and feel. The two horns on their head, called rhinophores, are chemical scanners that can alert them of approaching predators, guide them to food or to other nudibranchs. In fact, occasionally they will follow the slime trail of another slug or change direction if the chemicals of the slime indicates danger. Although they have shells at birth, they eventually give it up, relying instead on their much more sophisticated weapons. This humble little sea slug showcases the incredible handiwork of the creator, as well as his love for beauty. It's designs and creatures like this that remind us that there has to be a creator. I believe this is part of what the Apostle Paul was talking about. He said in Romans 1, 19 and 20, For what can be known about God is plain to mankind, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world, in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. I pray we all take this passage to heart and proclaim God as creator of all things instead of pretending that he doesn't exist. But Ryan, there's so many people who would say to us that, uh, you know, they, they don't see God. How can he possibly be the creator because they don't see him? Right. They say, for example, you know, you talk to them and they say, well, you know, we can tell that evolution uh, clearly developed the human race. Well, it's all about your worldview, right? It's all about what glasses you're wearing to look at the world around you. So if all you believe in natural, if all you believe in is naturalism, then that's all you're going to get back, right? So you're excluding the possibility of a creator, at the at the start, right? So you're not obviously going to come <clears throat> to the conclusion that there is a creator, right? Okay, so what you're saying is that that the world, so that the the, the they say, well, evolution is science, and a lot of people believe in that who are Christians, a lot of people <clears throat> are believers in Jesus Christ, and that's what they say, and you know, it's not required for them to believe in you know, creation in order mm -hmm. for them to, uh, you know, be a Christian. But at the same time, as you begin to study, and as we have studied, and we've looked at science has discovered and uncovered many things, and the, that the uncovering of the things about historical science mm -hmm. yeah. is assumptions. Yeah, well, it's not repeatable or testable or observable. You can't go back in the past and 
and perform science on mm -hmm. these things. So, so there's the, a distinction. There. We are at a disadvantage when we're trying to recreate history, whether that's yeah. whether that's origin history or whether that's regular human interaction history. Uh, we are at a disadvantage because we weren't there. So we do have to rely on uh, things that we can see mm -hmm. and 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 things that we can experiment with today. But it's never going to be perfect and it's never right. going to be exact. And we believe that an eyewitness mm. account is the best way to go. And mm. we believe that eyewitness account is the Bible. It is Genesis. God was so, there in the beginning. I, I mean, I read a book um, <clears throat> on this, and it was interesting because uh, the book said that the Bible is not to be taken literally. It's not intended to be taken literally. And uh, so people are foolish to take it literally. But you take it literally. Well, absolutely. You take Genesis 1 literally. Yeah, I take Genesis literally. I mean, obviously, there are some parts of the Bible that are meant to be poetic. But they're still yes. truths, of course, right? Mm -hmm. But yeah, absolutely. Genesis is historical. It's a historical narrative. As is, and there's no way to get around that no. it presents God creating the heavens and the earth and the human race and right. animals separately. And there's Adam, no way yeah. to get around that. Adam and Eve are real people. <clears throat> and I was talking to a scientist at the latest creation conference, and he was telling me they have actually they actually have evidence genetically for this. They're right, in the, the mitochondrial Eve. Yeah, and, and they're actually reconstructing the genome of Adam. Wow. This is, They're this reconstructing is science. Yeah. the genome of Adam, the yeah. first man? We're going to see. It's Dr. John Sanford and, and Dr. Rob Carter. We're going to see John Sanford in the new year on the program here because I sat down and talked with him. And it's absolutely fascinating. Yeah, there's actual evidence. Uh, and they're, you know... I mean, How do you that's do pretty that? amazing. That, that is amazing. You know? Uh, the, well, that, but, I mean, that is amazing. And the, the, other, the other question, of course, comes up is, you know, if... For example, you know, we've been around for uh, 100,000 years or whatever, then you look at the population, and the population would be much more than 7 billion plus people mm -hmm. that's on the planet today. You would see a population of like 700 billion people yeah. Yeah. on the planet, and mm -hmm. it would be very hard to figure that out. So there's some obvious conflict there that that is really fascinating mm -hmm, for and, sure you know i i think you should i think you should do a work on that in the future so i i'm just saying sure you know, that's sounds my, good yeah that's my <laughs> suggestion that's my my uh pitch for the products <laughs> all right okay <laughs> very good Corey. Uh, on john the baptist uh, a lot of people say that that uh, John the Baptist was a guy who got the less end of Jesus' ministry. He was the worst because he got his head cut off and all of that and never really finished his ministry. Jesus took over. And Jesus took over and, and let him die and all that. So, you know, he didn't get the best. Well, his, his, his ministry was a preparation ministry, and he knew that you know, uh, by his own admission, by his own teaching, uh, he was preparing for the way for the Messiah. Um, and, you know, you could say that pretty much about any prophet, because a lot of them were martyred <laughs> early, as was Jesus, as was Peter and Paul and almost all of the disciples. So. Yeah, that's, that's really true. Okay, very good. Well, we'll continue on on the next program.